A couple of corrections. Um, my wife has told me that um, it's not the chromosome, uh, not the DNA, which is male female. It's the chromosomes that are male female. So let's get that right. And my son has told me it wasn't Spock that wrote Baby Care. It was uh, Doctor. Sorry, it was Doctor Zeus that wrote, wrote, wrote the Cat in the Hat, not. Uh, not um, Spock. Right, Warwick? Got it. Okay. Apart from that, this is a tragic, tragic story I'm telling you tonight. Because we're, we're talking of man made magnificent. Man and men and women made in the image of God. Being destroyed by the wisdom of mankind. Being destroyed by this Lason Naprutas. Man being degraded. Man thinking of himself as an animal. And the image of God being destroyed within him. Now the last Lason that goes into the pot is the rise of the globalist left-wing progressive elite. So I've spoken about what has gone into that big black iron cooking pot with a fire underneath. I've spoken about fallen man. I've spoken about the enlightenment and man's darkened narrative. And I said, remember the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I've spoken about the narrative of sexual identity, Sigmund Freud, Alfred Kinsey, Dr. Benjamin Spock. I've spoken about the sexual and the feminist revolution. Last one, number seven, is the rise of the progressive left-wing elite. Go back to the general will from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I told you about the general will. Everything belongs to the state. You belong to the state. And the state is led by a leader who will transform mankind. And that took fruit in communism, in Stalinist Russia, and in Mao Zedong China, and in China today, and in North Korea, and other places too, that ruined their countries and ruined their people through communism, through this outworking of the general will. But that dream that dream within mankind to be as God and to create a new humanity has never died. It's still alive and doing quite well, thank you very much, in the West. The old way that the dream was going to be accomplished was through class warfare. That's right, yeah, through class warfare, wasn't it? The poor people were, going, were so poor, according to communist thinking, this thinking of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin and so, so forth. The poor people were so poor that they were going to rebel against the rich, the bourgeoisie, kill them all, and there was going to be a new perfect society brought to pass through class war. But class war, the poor rising up against the rich, never happened. Why not? Because the poor became too wealthy in the West. Because Western civilization is so good at making people wealthy. That's why America is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and so is Western Europe. Because those things I mentioned, freedom of speech, protection of property, um, the protection of women, are all so good, and the other things, uh, equality before the law, and an impartial justice system are so good that when they work they make a culture wealthy and if you had more of them in the Philippines you would be more wealthy but there, there never there never came class warfare because the working class in the West became richer but that dream of the new humanity the new perfect society, the new man has never died. It is still 
at work. It's still a hope, and I've called it the rise of the globalist left-wing progressive elite. The idea, the longing to overthrow the, res the existing order, the existing order of Western civilization, family, marriage, the Christian church, schools and universities, gender roles, the Bible in the United States of America, the Constitution, and ultimately Western civilization. The dream is still to overthrow that and to create a new humanity. The students of the 1960s, remember I was telling you of the students of the 1960s that went through the sexual revolution and the feminist revolution and everything I said about free love and gen, uh, be the gender you want and being authentic and do what you want, you are as God, you choose. They became, they have become the professors in the West. They have become the movie stars, the celebrities. And in the West, the celebrities speak as gods. And they have become the, the men and women that control the education system and the media managers, the people that run the, the media, like the New York Times and the news anchor woman and anchor men. You know, they sit, they have a, always have a silk tie on, lovely shirt, and they bring you the news. And they're paid about $900,000 a year. They're very wealthy. Those people, the controllers of YouTube, the controllers of Facebook and Twitter and the United Nations, they are carrying on that same, that same dream of creating a new society. And the way you create a new society is to overturn the old, the old structures. So, on the hit list, is the family, sexuality, marriage, liberty of conscience, freedom of speech, anything to do with Christians, the Bible, gender roles, and ultimately Western civilization. In my opinion, Western civilization is on the brink, as we say, on the brink, on the edge. I think France, UK, Germany, bye-bye they will descend into anarchy. United States, I don't know. Canada, I'm not sure. Australia and New Zealand, I'm not sure. But it's too late for Western Europe. They have gone too far down this road of overturning Western civilization. The old war was fought through class war. The new war is, to, is fought through gay rights. So you're going to change society. You're going to change Western civilization through gay rights. And there's a lot of them. Through sexual liberation. Through victim or identity politics. Th through taking blacks, Latinos, women. Remember what I said about women living in comfortable concentration camps? People of color, Muslims, LGBT, and every non-straight white male is a victim. And the left-wing progressives win their support. I don't think I've got, into, have got the time to get, go into the detail of how they do it, but they do it. They identify victims and they promise them, promise their support. They promise them, promise them their rights. And they win their support. Their gay, their, their objective is to overturn the old structures. It's a little bit like Men in Black. Do you know that movie? Well, there are aliens. And they come into our world, and when you look at them, you can't tell that they're aliens, but they are aliens. And the men in black are going to find them and kill them, I hope. That's how it is. 
within Western civilization, the educationalists, the left wingers, the news people, the media people, the people that are in positions of power and influence are like aliens. They are trying to overturn Western civilization. They look like everyone else. The universities still look like universities. They still look like they looked like 50 years ago. The professors still look like they looked like 50 years ago. The teachers still look like teachers, but inside they are like the aliens in Men in Black. They are working to overturn Western civilization and what they think is the old, repressive, bigoted, sexist, Bible-believing culture. They want that changed. But when you look at them, they look just the same as you or I. What they want is gender fluidity. They want sexual identity, this kind of thing, to flourish. They want the Bible to be removed utterly and Christianity to be removed utterly. They tell lies. One of the lies is that Western civilization was built on slavery. That is rubbish. Every civilization, every culture in the world has had slavery. And I would think the Philippines had it also before the Spanish and during the Spanish. As far as I know, every civilization has had slavery. Western civilization has removed slavery three times. Once, that's among our 700 AD, in the early empire, in the early age of Christianity, a second time in 1812, when the British put warships into the Atlantic Ocean and they destroyed all ships that were carrying slaves or turned the back or hung their captain, and again in the United States, which went to war over, over slavery, and 600,000 people died in the American Civil War. But the aliens that look like professors will tell you that the, the Western world is built on slavery and sexism and misogyny. It's not true. Okay. So where are we now? In the West, the family has been redefined to be a man and a man or a woman and a woman. It's your choice. In the West, in New Zealand and Australia, sexuality is a matter of your choice. That's a, your own legal decision. You can make your own decision what you want to be. Marriage can be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Liberty of conscience is restrained and restricted. They are making these aliens in the law courts, in the government circles, in positions of power and influence, are making very good progress. Liberty of conscience, freedom of speech, is, doing, is being shut down. There was a bishop of the Catholic Church in part of Australia. He wrote a simple piece defining what marriage was, that it is between a man and a woman. He was taken to court by the Human Rights Commissioner, and it cost him and his church a great deal of money. The Bible is regarded as a lot of rubbish. Gender roles are being overturned. So this agenda I've described is making good progress. And that is why I said that Western civilization is under a cloud. Those things that I mentioned first off that came out of the American Declaration of Independence are unique. You won't find them anywhere else except the United States and the UK and those countries that have been influenced by Western civilization, which includes the Philippines. Now, we'll go on to the new cool aid. 
Some of you are aware that when I spoke about the big, the large black cooking pot, I was referring to 2 Kings chapter 4, where Elijah, where there is a big black cooking pot and there is poison in the pot. I'm quoting from 2 Kings chapter 4. I have been describing the poison in the pot. There is death in the pot, it says in 2 Kings chapter 4. The death, I want to talk to you now about the death in the pot. 2 Kings chapter 4, the death in the pot, the new Kool-Aid. You know what Kool-Aid is, do you? Well, if you drink it, you die. It's, it means, in Western culture, it means death. So now we're talking, I want to talk to you about the new Kool-Aid. Death in the pot, the lasong. The new Kool-Aid, the new death, is that differing sexual desires make up different species of people. Each species is an acceptable identity rooted in your own choice of sexual orientation. It's a noun. It's something you are. It's your abiding identity. It's not something you do. It is something you are. And this new humanity of sexual identity covers everything within a person, from within to without. And with it, every imaginable sexual freedom. All of this is accepted by the globalist Western elite as an immortal truth, like the Bible. You accept the Bible, don't you? But the Western liberal left-wing progressive elite accept it now as an immortal truth, an eternal truth. That's why when oh, there was some issue over gay rights in the United States, President Barack Obama lit, out, lit up the White House in gay liberation colors. It was a new truth. And if you don't follow this new truth, it's because you are a bigot. You're full of hate. Your feelings are true. Just remember that. Your feelings are true. And no one is to question them. Here's a quote for you. The worst thing we can do is to conform to some moral code that is imposed upon us from the outside. Parents, society, church. Any such imposition would undermine our unique identity, our authentic self, Meaning must be found within ourselves and must resonate within our one-of-a-kind personality. That is the new death in the pot, the new immortal truth. The second death in the pot, the second lasson, is it makes things very, very, very hard for Christians who have attractions to the same sex very hard it makes it very hard for a person who doesn't want to become a lesbian or doesn't want to become gay because it makes an identity out of temptation it's like me saying to you hello see Richard Co I am a greedy Christian you wouldn't like that. You wouldn't think that was good. But with this new lasson, if, I, if a person says, I am a gay Christian, is, is accepted as good and true and brave and noble. It makes it very, very hard for people who struggle with same-sex attraction. I have no doubt, not the slightest doubt in the world, that some of you struggle with same-sex attraction. Two of those books down there that are written by pastors are, are written by men who have same-sex attraction. Because we're fallen creatures. We are motivated. Our inner desires have fallen, twisted out of shape. It's hard to repent of sexual orientation once it is accepted in society. You can repent of sexual sin, you can try, 
you, you, it's easier to it's easy well it's easier to repent of sexual sin but it's harder to repent of sexual orientation once it, it has been mainlined or become a part of our culture now I'm going to talk about the Christian response in 2nd Kings chapter 4 Elijah says bring me some flour and he puts the flour in that big black pot and the contents of the pot become edible what went into that big black pot was lasan poison but he puts some flour in and it becomes good nourishing food that flour that good nourishing food is the gospel so this is what you need to do and I want to talk to you as I would talk to myself if I was talking to someone who had same-sex attractions I'm talking generally now I'm talking to you as I would talk to myself as I, or as I would vi as vi advise others one go back to the grand narrative of God remember sinfulness marks everyone from birth and is there in the form of a motivationally twisted heart we are all in the same boat we are all born with fallen desires we're all on a level playing field I don't believe that a person with same sex traction is down there and and the rest of us who just start struggle with greed and looking at pornography are up here that's not true we all struggle we all face sin we all have fallen desires we all have secrets you know we are all on a level playing field someone who struggles with unwanted unwanted homosexual lust is not more distorted or more broken than anyone else that's how I see it the presence of same-sex attraction does not mean that the person has sinned more than someone else we all have feelings that are warped and we are all of us under the judgment of God that is coming like a train down the tracks and are saved by the grace of God we are all equally need the grace of God and I believe that given different circumstances any Christian could potentially face this problem because of the fall and from this reality of course flows the great rescue story of the Bible that's what it's all about saving rescuing people who really do need to be saved so my second point is you need to step into his story this story the world has its story in Australia our story is the good life you ought to be living the good life consumption is redemption that is buying things having things owning things is like being a Christian it brings happiness it gives enrichment it gives a reason to live and that's why we have these great shopping cathedrals with light coming in from the sky that's just like it's just like the Notre Dame really you go in and you can buy all these things and look at them and see how your life will be enriched and it's like it's like being in church the lights coming down there you can drink your coffee and your life is enriched by buying so we say con consumption buying is redemption and sex is salvation have sex whenever with whoever you want be authentic be yourself follow your dreams that's what we have in Australia but we have the true story and the key to understanding the true story is the word redemption we are redeemed we are purchased we are liberated from the world and our redemption is packed full and loaded up to the top with the love and the grace of God 
Christ loves us best and we cannot love ourselves more than he loves us. We cannot change ourselves, but he can. The solution to gay identity and all of those 71 different genders, the solution to same-sex temptation, it's not, heterosex it's not heterosexuality. That is too shallow. It's not come to Jesus and he will make you happy and straight. The solution is the love of Jesus Christ. The solution is to come to Jesus Christ and his redemption and salvation. The solution is a new affection for him. It's not becoming straight. It's too shallow. Rosaria Battlefield says this. That's the woman I said was a lesbian professor in gender identity. She became a Christian. She said, I gained a new affection. And that affection or love was not heterosexuality. But she did marry, by the way. She's married to a pastor. <laughs> Quite a change, debate. I gained a new affection, and that affection was not heterosexuality, but Jesus, my friend and my saviour. I was not converted out of homosexuality. I was converted out of unbelief, the world of unbelief, the world that man has constructed, which is poison. My sexual desire for woman hinged or turned upon a deeper sin turned or danced upon the glittering tip of the knife of pride. There it is. I shall be as God. Pride. A pride that rejected patriarchy, that is men, as a flat-out danger and combining this with a homosocial affinity to woman that morphed, changed into sexual practice. So Stepping into God's story mean, means we abandon desires to make meaning of our own life on our story, on our terms, as we understand it. According to the wisdom of man, we leave and we cleave. We abandon the world's wisdom. We abandon the world's story and we cleave to the story of the scripture. We leave and we cleave. We do not make sense of our life based on the preciousness of our own feelings. They're fallen. They're twisted. We leave our feelings behind. We rebuild our life on this story. Number three, light the flame of union with Christ. Everything that the world offers with man's darkened narrative, is kun wari. We have an identity already. It's in Christ. It's in our union with Christ. Our union with Christ is from eternity. Ephesians 1.4, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's worked out in Christ, in his perfect life, death and resurrection. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, Ephesians 2, chapter 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You are raised up with him. You are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages to come, he might show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward, towards us in Christ. In Christ, with Christ, in Christ, with Christ. Our union is with him. That is your real, lasting, eternal union. That is your identity. That's where your identity comes from. It comes from being in union with Christ, chosen from eternity, bound up in his life and his death and his resurrection. And that union is dynamic. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about how we are being renewed 
in the spirit of our minds. That's the new creation. There was a creation which was ruined by sin, by the sin of mankind. There is a new creation. I believe it's a bigger, better creation. And every Christian here in this room is involved in that new creation, and you are being recreated to be like Jesus Christ. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewed, made new. We are God's flawed masterpieces being repaired. We are magnificent ruins being rebuilt. We find life and identity only through God in Christ. Colossians, your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, you are not a gay Christian or a Christian who is gay. The word gay is simply a linguistic tool used by the gay liberation movement to soften the word and make it more acceptable to our culture. You are either a professing Christian who is surrendering to same-sex attractions and the world of unbelief that will be fatal to your soul. You are either a Christian who has fatal appetites, fatal desires, or you, have, or you are a Christian with same-sex attractions, but you are resisting by God's grace, as every Christian must do, no matter how intense the longings, and as Jesus did in the garden, sweating drops of blood against temptation. Not from within, he wasn't fallen as we are, but from without. He leads the way. As he faced temptation, so must we. There's two choices. You are surrendering or you are resisting. Four, go to war like every other Christian. Here's Sam, Sam Albury, one of the books down there. He says, ever since I have been open about my same-sex attraction, so he's a pastor in the UK, he always had same-sex attraction. He noticed it when he was among our 13, 14, 15 years old. He thought, hello, it's, I'm different. He became a Christian. He said, ever since I've been open, he's quite open about this. He pastors a church and his people know he has same-sex attraction. He says, ever since I've been open about my same-sex attraction, a number of friends have said, the gospel must be harder for you than it is for me as though I have had to give up more than they do. But the fact is, the gospel demands everything from all of us. The gospel demands the same thing, whatever temptation you face, which is everything, all. No matter what your temptation is, there is no temptation which is easier. The temptation to greed and lust in pornography is endemic in the Western world. It just breaks my heart how many men I know look at pornography in the church. It's bad. It's really bad. Listen, for God to forgive a person who as it has same-sex attraction. That's not hard. If he forgave David, if he gives, forgives murderers, if he gives people who look, if he forgives people that look at pornography, if he lives, if he forgives greedy people, it's not hard for him to forgive people who have same-sex attraction. He's just as willing to forgive that person in his love and give his spirit and his help to live a godly life. Don't think, if you have same-sex attraction, don't think of it in terms of same-sex attraction. Change the language. Change it to same-sex temptation. It's just a small change in the language, but it's significant. So then you're thinking. You're not dealing with a tr a, an attraction, because an attraction can be good. I'm attracted to running. I like running. I'm attracted to it. I just want to run. 
But let's change the language to same-sex temptation. Temptation is bad. It doesn't always have a bad result. Jesus was tempted. But it's not a good thing in and of itself. So change the language in your head to same-sex temptation as in attracted to greed or murder or lust. Even if it's incredibly intense, that attraction, it can still be overcome. And the scripture says, For if by the Spirit you put, the de you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. You have to put it to death. Because sin will lead to your death. You have to kill sin, every sin. At the moment we're talking about sexual sin. All sexual sin then must be put to death. Either you kill it or it will kill you. It doesn't stop in one room of the house. It wants the whole house. It doesn't stop in your head. It wants everything. That's why James says... Excuse me. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, and when sin has conceived, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin it is accomplished, it brings forth death. So when you sin. Let's say you sin sexually and look at pornography. You don't die straight away, but you're on the way. If you continue on that road, it leads to death. So you must be killing sin, all kind of sin, or it will kill you. If you look at porn... Because you come home and you're tired and you've had a bad day and a busy day and you just want to relax and have a few minutes to yourself and just, just relax and just, just, just relax. That will kill you. You have to put it to death. You must stop it and put it to death. If you have a same-sex attraction... Let's say you're a man and you have a same-sex attraction. Getting married to a woman is not necessarily going to help. You'll still have the same attraction. And the same if you're a woman. Getting married, let's say I'm attracted to men. Uh, what do I do? What do I do? I'm just attracted to men all the time. I, I'm just not romantically or sexually attracted to women. I'm just more attracted to men. What do I, I'll, I'll get married. I'll find a girl who will marry me and I'll, I'll get married. It doesn't solve the problem. I'm still, I'm still going to be attracted to men. I have to put it to death. I have to kill it or it will kill me. If I marry, it will still be there and it will grow. I must put it to death. That's what Romans 8.13 says. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. And if you resist, that will be a testimony of the Christian faith and of God's grace. And you are a hero of the faith, just like anyone else who overcomes any other temptation. You should be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. You're a hero of the faith. All those conquered through faith. Last point, preach the gospel. Life is bleak in the West, as in Madugo. Life is bleak, B-L-E-A-K, bleak. Bleak as in living in a chaotic world. Bleak as being emotionally exhausted. Bleak as in a meaningless world where no relationship lasts. Bleak, as in meaningless sex, like an animal, like a dog. So we proclaim the gospel. I'm not overly pessimistic about the Christian church in Australia. We preach the gospel, the life and death of resur and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People will come to faith. 
That's the power of the gospel. Last thing. Look, if you struggle with any kind of sexual sin, think about Psalm 119, 71. It is good to me, it, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. It's not a, it can work together for good because as we struggle against temptation, as we struggle against the affliction and the curse of sin, we come closer to God. We learn his statutes. That's what Jesus did, not with, from within, but he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So with us, so will we. As we struggle and overcome, we will be enriched. The end.